let's start. Let's start. We know that population is living longer and, uh, and they're healthier. So they're living longer and they're healthier. And they come in your practice with dentistry that's failing or the teeth are failing. And uh, there's a, who has a concept of healthy aging where people age and we all do, but they stay healthy. And it's really important to understand that like, you know, we all get older, but being healthy is integral part because you have a improved quality of life. You, you know, uh, you don't demand, you put a huge demand on the health services. Uh, or you pay a lot of tax for it because other people benefit from health services. That's fine. It's democracy. Uh, just reminds me of Dave and I used to go to a Western hospital and see people in the ivy drip outside the hospital stand and then smoking at the same time. A wonderful scene, but I'll never forget that. Anyway, so not only that, but also the fact that uh, they live longer uh, and they're healthier and uh, they want to maintain their quality of life. So in relation to, in the early days, people were happy with dentures. And today, they're not happy with dentures. But the option of dentures is always there. There's nothing wrong with it. And uh, there's an echo from me. Is that right? No, I'll go out there. Oh, good. Okay. So when you think about how do we look at these patients in terms of to improve their quality of life, and how do we manage these patients for long term uh, is important because uh, as you get older, uh, although you may be healthy, but things can happen and your health can deteriorate. And so when we plan these cases, we have to think about the long term outcome of treatment, not a quick fix where you go A, B, C, it's done, and you put it on DPR to see how good you are, or the others put on DPR, where we need to look at these patients on a long term. So it's very important that when patients present in your practice, you'll be able to spend time with your patients. And this is referred by a good colleague of mine for assessment. And as you can see what's happening over there, we'll come to it in a minute. But this allows you uh, to plan longer term. Now, what does long-term planning really mean? It means that you need to have a feasibility. In other words, where am I going? Which way is this case going to go? What would be the possible complications? That means your contingency planning. Understanding there'll be complications in the treatment. Understanding the complications are not related to your treatment, but it will be there anyway. But that needs to be put in a patient's headspace. So they understand. Until they understand, I, my personal view is I will not proceed. And my letter to the patient will state all the possibilities, what my view is, that this will happen in the future. So when that does happen, we know how to deal with it. If it doesn't happen, fine. At least we know that patient understands and owns their problem. Because the patient doesn't understand and doesn't own the problem, it's your problem. And that's the important part of dentistry. So in many ways in the webinar, people wanna know, how do I do a trick? So give me a trick and I'll do it. As I told you before, I can teach a monkey how to put an implant, no an issue. No an issue. Doesn't mean anything to me. There's a disease in dentistry where everyone wants to do implants. I think the disease should be controlled to say, hey, let's really be a good diagnostician. My specialty, as they can verify it, is a pair of dollars, a specialist pair of dollars. My specialty is diagnosis first. Would that be right, Stan? Would that be the first thing? You have to. Okay. I mean, there's no other way. So coming back to the slide, when we talk about the college, we talk about this. Stan's picture is missing. He'll come there soon. We talk about how to think and we teach. We'll talk about this a bit later on, but you know, we're getting quite a few students now, which is really great. I'm glad that people are coming in. So you're gonna have almost a full house coming soon. So any of you thinking about the college, I'm happy to answer you later on, but that's fine. But let's just go with a with a with a with a webinar. So eventually patients coming in and they have you know uh, problems, as you can see. 
And uh, you can see that uh, this is a carbim CTLPG, it's not a, so a true LPG, but still diagnostic enough. Uh, there's a lot of problems. And uh, uh, I would say, uh, it was a, you know, this is a healthy aging, patients generally healthy, doesn't even take medications, age 74, very well built, and it has a failing dentistry. Um, can anyone comment me why his dentist is failing? I'd like an audience to come up with an answer. Please talk to me. I want participation here. Why is it failing? You can see they're failing on the implants. Is there anything else you can see that's happening here? Is it because of the patient's uh, medical history due to smoking, aging, or anything? He's not Just, smoking. That's uh, a good question. He's not smoking. He's 74. Is 74 considered old or young? That's a hard question. You have to ask the patient. It's how young do you feel? That's important to ask. Okay. So, any other questions? I mean, I'll like to, I'll ask someone. Leonie, I'm going to ask you a question, darling. Your, your experience, colleague of mine. Yeah, okay. Yes. Oh, hello. How are Hi. you? Hi. What would you like to know? Darling, you see this patient in your practice. I mean, Yes, uh, I've got lots why is it of failing? The question is, why is it failing? Oh, why is it failing? I guess it's, um, I, I say to people that there's been, everything's been resuscitated too many times. Right, very good. And everything's been dealt with in steps rather than deal with the whole, whole situation. Right. Um, but I would need more information to be able to make a, a, an assessment. I'd want to know, um, you know, has he had a lot of work done a long time ago and nothing much since then? And the background to the whole thing. Very good. He comes from Poland and yeah. uh, a lot of work has been done in Poland. Yeah. And a lot of uh, people travel overseas back to their country to get work done here and there. Yeah. So because they can travel, it's also cheaper. Yeah. Uh, and this is very common. I mean, we see them all the time nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Uh, so from your, and I agree with you, Leonie, well said. Uh, Put it this way, do you think that uh, uh, what he's been through with uh, no fluoridation, mainly mechanical sort of dentistry, yeah. and, you know, lots of posts, half downward therapies, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, he basically could not say what gum disease was. Uh, that was a problem because he never, he said, nobody ever told me at my age that I might have a gum disease. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure Stan is looking at the pockets to look at the foundation. You can see my bone loss. Uh, I look at bone loss. I look at the foundation. So I'm looking at, you know, which one do you think is going to go first? Which one to go first? I mean, obviously the implant on the right side, we're not going to go first. Yeah. Here. We, we know that. And he, although, fair, funny enough, it's still not mobile. It's still strong. So the last, last bit, okay, still holding this. Uh, it's almost like the periodontal situation, standing got a little bit of roots and holding the tooth and with a strong bone is maintained but we lost one. So uh, what else do you think is happening here in terms of uh, failing dentistry? It is failing. Uh, you know, I mean, you can see that different parts of the mouth have been treated at different times. And uh, from my point of view, he's also clenching. He's a strong clench, a bit of proximate. Look, he's 74. I mean, you know, there's a normal way, normal attrition, which happens. But it's something that we need to think about, right? We, you know, in many ways. So we know that uh, we know that this is going to go. And uh, we also know that there's other problems in the, in the mouth. Uh, just looking at the x-ray provided by the patient with, from the dentist. This is this bridge here is is in a very um, in a poor situation, guarded to poor situation, where it'll basically break down. This is an angle post. This is going to fracture, and we're looking a bit more further. Besides periodontal, I'll come to periodontal in a second. I guess then to comment on this, you can see that we have a periodontal area, and maybe another one there. We're not sure. There's an epical area. There's an epical one four. Not quite sure about one seven there, but there's a lot happening, and. Uh, so it makes you think about when I get this x-ray, how I'm going to treat this patient. It looks more dismal on the x-ray than actually does when you look at intraorally, for instance. So what do you see here?
let me ask a question. Is Isidora there? No. Dr. Sarkis Khan, Ravi replies a lot of bear. That's attrition, I guess. Uh, can, let, let the, Senator, can Senator come on and speak? Right? Car, attrition to a lot of wear, yeah. Khan, you can talk. We can talk. Come on. Khan, you're going to be the part of the course. You need to. <laughs> Khan, we're going to make you talk. <laughs> become friends that's, with everybody. No, uh, that's all for now, Sarkis. <laughs> yes, you can. Come on, let's go. So you're going to see lots of wear. I agree. I agree. I see lots of wear. Yes. Chip crowns, uh, bridge. The bridge, bridge here, yeah. right. And uh, uh, do you feel that uh, there's a delamination of the porcelain here, sir? Yes, yes. Right, okay. That's an old uh, Procera bridge that was placed a long time ago. Been there a long time. Uh, and that's... Uh, an... Yes? Dr. Sarkis, Grace uh, says tongue looks very dry. Is there xerostomia? Uh, no, it's actually fine. Just unfortunately, the angle, but it's a good point. Good observation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, uh, and you can see where he has some work done. But overall, you know, for age 74, what he's been through, it's not too bad. So, from the, from the, from the, from a risk assessment point of view, he's got, uh, you know, a lot of the work that he has, uh, has been restorative based. And uh, wherever he can manage to clean the teeth, he cleans his teeth. So obviously he's been, you know, doing a good natural hygiene. But there's a problem with the lower arch, and I'll show you that in a minute. In a minute. But thank you, that's a very good observation. And uh, the lamination and general wear. So what happens is that he starts losing teeth. So the implant goes, mm -hmm. and uh, the lower left canine starts to go, and upper left went. So basically, when he saw me at that time, um, he he wasn't ready for any treatment. He, was, he believed things will stay, but when things started to fail, he was immediately of the opinion that, or maybe uh, Sarkis was right. Uh, he went for his dentist back to me, and uh, the dentist from Venice ever said, look, Sarkis, can you just fix him up? He's coming back and forth. You have to fix him up. So put your foot down and fix him up. I <laughs> said, so, well, hang on a minute. So we have a terminal dentition. And uh, like my question would be, Although age has something to do with it, and I'll, I'll ask the question a bit later on, but there's a lot of etherogenic you know, work has been done here, yeah. although done by the dentist's uh, best capability, but things start to fail. So in your opinion, in your opinion, how would age be a risk factor in this case? Or is it? I'm going to pick a name. Well, I think the only risk factor, Sarkis, is the um, the fact that the as he's getting older, his teeth are going to be more br brittle. Mm -hmm. um, so really, that's the only one. So you wouldn't want to um, got to watch what's the crown root ratio for him and what the forces on his teeth are considering he's a bruxer. And so I don't think that's really age. I think that's more a bruxism thing, but only the brittleness of the tooth I'd be worried about. So yeah. I'd, I'd be inclined to engineer it a little bit higher than I normally would say for a patient in their forties. Well said, interesting, well said. Sometimes you go over engineer it, that's right. Very well said. Well, that's, we'll come to the next question. Uh, I'll add on to that. Leon is saying basically, age is force, time, duration. Oh, cool. Force, time, duration. And that's what happens. So it will fatigue any restoration. And the teeth that have root therapy are generally drier, they're more brittle. And uh, having uh, root therapy teeth, you have reduced proprioception by 50%. So Bruxing, not able to, and the different restorative material in enamel. So forces transmitted to the root system, although it can be dissipated some by uh, periodontal membrane, the occlusion, the, the balance, the unevenness of the occlusion, they're all add to the force 
you know, into, uh, into uh, amplifying the forces on the dentition. And uh, that will eventually lead to fatigue and time forces, you know, over a period of time, and things will start to fail. And that's normal. That's very normal. I agree. Thank you for that, Leo. So having said that, let me talk about trip and plan. Okay. And I know a lot of colleagues will go inside and say, yep, get all on four, that's the end of the story. And maybe do something at the top, fix him up, and we can fix him up for good, all on four, all on four, whatever. But it's just not that simple. It's not that simple. It's actually quite a complicated case because passion is also has got very high um, expectations. And uh, uh, you know, he wants a lot more than... Uh, what your what my initial assessment was and, and that took some time to explore to learn and I thought that was critical for me in my decision making process as I treat this patient over the period of time so when we talk about treatment sequence and naturally we like to first uh, you know uh, how do we plan this case you stabilize control the situation so in this particular case you would look at uh is periodontal problem. You look at there's any uh, closure problem, which is a high contacts, and in practice you would adjust them. Do with the arch level, look at the crown root ratio. Like you look at a patient patient level, tooth level, gum level, and bone level. So you get all these different levels of assessment. But the most important thing here is not only normal lectures, the maintenance issue, because there's a reason why the patient started and they came to you. So the maintenance. Needs to, needs to be part of the initial assessment. So the patient says to me, look, I can't commit coming here all the time, just fix my teeth. And given the level of cost that I involved, level of commitment that I involved, I probably would stop the treatment. And that'll be a very, very good point for me to stop right there because I'm not gonna take on the risk because the patient wants me, me to own his problem rather than the patient demonstrating that he's gonna be a good compliant patient before I proceed. This is the point, this is the make and break a case which is most important, but actually very little discussed in seminars and other webinars where they talk about how to fix things because that doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, we can fix things, but the patient needs to understand the problem. So having said that, uh, what Stan would require, and that's mandatory, we need to look at this bone level, look at the attachment level, and uh, we need to test the system. Stan, would you comment on this? Please. You look, we'll just go through the probing depths at the moment yeah. and loss of attachment. Recession, you've got uh, probing depths, recessions one and two. So the main thing that you need is loss of attachment, right, which is yeah. a combination of the probing depths and the recession. If you look at him, you've got five and sixes, molars all the way through, even the two central incisors if you look at those they yeah. had no restorations and i was looking at them on the actual x-ray if we can go back to your opg can we just quickly do that they are the ones that no restorations or minimal restorations look at the bone level so everything else that's breaking down has some form of complex restoration mm -hmm. yes right so a lot of that is iatrogenic. Yeah, it is. It is. And this happens in Australia too. I don't think it happens in Poland. Mm. That's the thing that sort of stands out. You look at the OPG, you say, right, right, the complex restorations. Look at the two centrals. Minimal restorations or no restorations. Well, look at the bone levels. All right, there has been some bone levels. Plant control here. may not have been there. But generally is perio moderate, you know, except for these, but this is a peri-implantitis, even with these ones here. Yes, right. It's a classic so there is still, obviously, plaque control is not ideal. You have to sort of go through and, you know, reduce the inflammation if you go through. But if you look at, can we have a look at the anterior region? The clinical, yeah. No, before that's after treatment. Before no, that's before. This is before. He this hasn't had that. All right, that's after cleaning. Okay. Yeah, we lost the bridge here. Had to go. Yes. Okay. So if, you, if you look at it, it's trained. You've had further research. I also reduced the occlusion here to improve the plan. So reduce the loading. 
you know, just to see how we go. Yeah. Clark control still not ideal. Not yet. ideal, no. But he's still using close. I mean, he's trying. I mean, that, that I'm not saying that he's trying there, right? Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. when do you start complex restorations? For him? Yes. Ah, good question. Well, let's look at the upper arch. It's improving the hydrogen on the upper arch. It doesn't look too bad there, right? Mm. Especially these ones. Yeah. See, that's the issue. So why have you got so much problems with the lower arch? It's the atrogenic, like you said. Okay? Atrogenic. It's hard to clean those areas. Now you know, he's able to, or for whatever the reason is, he needs to really improve his oral hygiene here because if he decide to do implants here, I want the same improved in hygiene level so he can maintain the implant health. Not, not uh, forgetting the fact that he lost the, you know, there's implants, okay, uh, because of perio as well as the design of these restorations was not commensurate with the oral hygiene, you know, access and maintenance. He couldn't clean those teeth, uh, those implants. He couldn't clean around them. It's only a matter of time before you start losing blood anyway. You know, and, and, uh, and also there was cemented, so God knows what's in there. You can't see on the RPG. There's some, there must be a lot of cement in there. You probably call it, you know, cementitis, peri-cementitis. Okay, coming back to this. He's improving. So he's improving. You can see that improvement in the slip level of the gums, obviously. Okay, he's trying his best. And the uh, substitutional plaque was removed. Uh, and looking at the upper arch, it isn't done too bad. So when we look at this whole thing clinically now, okay. Now, provided we did the periodontal treatment, let's say that's completed. Okay, where do we go from here? How would they do it? I mean, what would the uh, treatment, I mean, you know, uh, where else would you look at it uh, in this situation? Uh, let me help someone. Let me help you. Uh, let's say we have to restore this mouth. And uh, the only teeth that are really can be maintained for a long term is the lower incisors, four teeth. How would you plan this case? Very demanding patient. And uh, you can see the restrictions on the lower posterior side are quite large and bulky. And if you have a class two div two um, dual relationship in this particular patient, uh, it's very deep bite very deep bite. If you have to plan restorations and it would involve, uh, you know, again, uh, only a lot of front teeth remaining. Uh, and uh, we don't have a lot of space to restore. What would you do in this case? Okay. Where would you start? Uh, where would you start? Any further extraction? Well, we need to design. I mean, you need to think about him. We need to get a previous x rays. Um, Dr. Yeah. Sarkis, yes. um, Arthur says full lower clearance alveolectomy to implants over denture. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. Can I ask why? Yeah, Arthur, why would you say that? But please tell me. And that's, that's an answer too. That's a very well answer. But you, you, you see, when you think about it, I just want to come back to this. He's got a pretty wide arch. Okay, he's got a wide arch from from almost lower left seven to lower right six. But even you know, he he wants to chew his food. He wants a full arch, and. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that uh, he, he his main concern was, and that's a good question. So you you assume that we're going to do 
are lactomy and to implants? I would say yes, uh, but what's your rationale for saying that? I was giving lots of hints, but understand you want lower, eventually loss of posterior support, plus I will be right. likely eventually a fracture. Fracture but... the bite, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. I'd like you to talk to you in person. I think you're most welcome to come and talk to, to us on the microphone. But here's the question. Uh, do you feel the patient would benefit with two implants and other dentures? He's 74. And everything has been fixed in his mouth. You think, and he's a very sort of strong, you know, good looking guy. Uh, how do you think it will affect his, uh, uh, you know, uh, confidence if he had something removed in his mouth? You can answer, you can talk to us. Um, Arthur, you can just type the message and I can just uh, say it to Dr. Okay. Sarkis, or you can just honestly un just unmute and just speak to Dr. Sarkis yourself. You can, by all means, be happy to talk to you, okay? You see, two overdenture, two implants and overdenture will work fine. It just, if the patient's happy with removable prosthesis. And again, remember we talked about the consent initially, is that we feel that's the simplest way for the patient. In that case, I will say, why two implants? Why can't you just put one implant? That'll work just as well as two implants will, right in the middle. Dr. Sarkis, he's replied saying, uh, removable will allow for better hygiene in elderly years. You can put one implant. Well, thank you for your concern. I appreciate it. <laughs> 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 okay that's very good okay so uh, Hi, Sarkis. yeah i think for this patient the most essential thing is his posterior support so i would be inclined to suggest um sectioning dodgy bridge in quadrant three and placing some implants to replace if there's enough room in quadrant three, leaving the, the abutments in place. Um, so he's functional, at least while everything's healing um, and trying to get some posterior support and not even go with what the final solution is at this point. Because if you give him, if you give this guy a denture, you're telling him he's old. By the way he looks after his teeth, he doesn't think he's old. That's and right. so um, it has to be fixed. And I'd be inclined to try and give him some back teeth, um, not change the status quo, perhaps instead of putting um, porcelain abutments on it, put something on in resin while we sort out the rest of the case. Okay. Bit bit. Okay. That's a solution. Leonie. So what would you, sorry, can I just clarify sure, that? Sure. What would you maintain? You'll go from three to three or four to four. Where would you go, Leonie? Um, well, I'm. I think ultimately the treatment plan is keep the lower anteriors um, and ditch the rest. Yes. But a lot of this, um, I have a lot of patients in this age group, um, and so the whole thing about it is to, um, I guess, respect their dignity and not just try and throw bits of plastic at them because they don't like that. Um, they're trying to avoid that. And from his point of view, he spent a lot of money on his teeth to achieve that. So psychologically speaking, um, I would give him some back teeth that he feels that we're gaining something. So he, he's, he's a smart man. He would know that the, everything's failing, but you, you want to give him a bit of a win and give yourself a bit of posterior support that you can vary. So um, I'm inclined to section the bridge in quadrant three, take the two pontics off. If you can put something in the space, um, then you've got something to make a temporary abutment on and then go with, deal with the front teeth if you need to deal with the bite because you can vary things, put stuff on top of the pontix, even make a treatment kind of composite on the top of it if you want to open dimension. But anyway, I would always go with something that you can stick on and then he can't, doesn't have to take off. But I always do. You, so you take, will increase the occlusion, occlusion height posteriorly. Um, if you, you were saying that there's not sufficient height you were, you were concerned with, I think you said earlier, Sarkis? Yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah. Uh, it's not it's only not sufficient height. I'm basically asking the question in terms of if you had to create height, how would you create in this particular case? Uh, well, um, it's going to really stress out the remaining teeth. So I personally would take the chicken option and um, 
if he's happy and he's got no TMJ issues and he's 74, no I'd PMJ like issues. deal with the status quo. Okay, done. Maintain as it is. Okay, fair enough. I agree with that. Uh, understand with posterior support, and that's that's a triple option if the patient wishes. Mm. If the patient wishes to retain the lower anteriors, and provided he is looking after, we have a good resolution. And if Stan, uh, from his point of view, is happy that we can maintain lower six front teeth. The only thing with those teeth, I'm just refreshing your mind. Uh, uh, if you look at it, we got quite a quite a um, yeah. considerable loss of bone attachment here. So the problem that is quite quite is what is this? This is six 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 up to about eight here. So there's a root fracture definitely here. So he's yeah. going to lose a canine. Okay, yeah. and this is about to go. So the bridge is hopeless. So basically, if I had to really nail it down. There'll probably be about maybe four teeth here, okay, that we can keep. And then and then because if you look at the occlusal plane and the whole thing, and for the sake of four teeth, the question again, give the patient the option, look, we can do this, and we can maybe I mean how many from your point of view, how many implants did you put uh, on a, each segment? Would you put two in each side or would you put three on each side? Why would you plan it? Leone. Sorry, I thought you were speaking hypothetically. That's okay. <laughs> Everybody, sorry, sir. That's okay. Oh, oh, it's good. I mean, you, you, you're on the, you're on the mark you're here. Let me clean oh, myself, aren't you? <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, would you put two <laughs> implants on each side, or would you put three on each side? Um, are you talking ultimately, or in a st in my step by step version? Well, eventually it'll be ultimate. So, what would yes. you do? Well, ultimately, I would plan for the best thing for the patient. So, if I think the tooth isn't going to last, um, isn't going to last five years, it's out. If it's going to last five to ten, it's po it's possible. Mm. And if it's going to last longer than that, it gets to stay. Okay. So uh, that's. Me, my... I'm just throwing a scenario, and I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, let's say he's 74, five years, and be 80, and his health will deteriorate. Yep. And he might have bridges on each side. Yep. And suddenly bottom teeth start to go. It's got a special medication kind of implant placement. Uh, where would you go from there? I'd run. I'm sorry? <laughs> I said I'd probably run. Right, right. Uh, look, um, I, I'm just being, I feel like yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm Jeff Robertson. I'm just trying to throw things at things and try to. So that's, that's the thought process that I go through when I plan mm -hmm. these cases. And I'm with you, Ro uh, Leonie. Uh, understand and this was put to the patient by the way yep. so all this was put to the patient and uh and patient thought uh look uh for all this time um you know well um uh, you know what can we do so the question is that uh when we look at anteriorly and it's a very deep part here not because bite really matters it doesn't do anything to me but to create a, a nice uh, plan of occlusion uh, because that's going to help me you know, in a number of factors. He wants to look good also. He you know, is, is, is one of those guys who drives a, a Porsche. He likes to chat with young ladies and uh, you know, he wants to look good. He was a, you know, ex small of his time at home. He's a really good looking guy for his age. So, and he chews really, so really chews sort of hard stuff. He likes to chew well. And, uh, and again, you mentioned Leon, that, you know, you want to load this dentition because it's already loaded. Um, you can see the cross part here. So it's being loaded both sides. Uh, and he, you know, it's a very, very hard diet. So I would say, assuming that the periodontal condition is taken care of, I would probably try to look at the uh, occlusal, uh, you know, management of this case. I would look at my, what sort of prescription would I give this patient in my planning? of the occlusion prescription, how would I manage this case? And we spend a lot of time uh, discussing with the patient, you know, uh, and uh, when you think about it, we don't have a lot of space. Uh, you don't have a lot of space to do much. And it, as a matter of fact, it, you know, would you open the bite? You say you'll stress a dentition, I agree. I mean, if I try to open this bite, uh, you know, whether he'll be able to adapt, that's not the question. There's a chance he might. Is healthy enough to that, but uh, I mean, if you look at the uh, now, what would you do in this situation? Like, 
uh, what would your um, concept would be? Would you consider holding those one, two, three, four teeth? Because that's filing. That's filing. So those four teeth, that, that's starting to go. That's gone. That's gone. So you have that, and this is about to go. All right. So how would you do? Would you consider that and try to uh, build your posterior implants at this level? Uh, after all, uh, uh, these teeth are loading more. Okay, your implants can take some load. Here they can take some load, but they're starting to load more. So, and you have this uneven occlusal plane that uh, is not commensurate to redistributing loading. You see what I'm saying? And, and assuming that in five years, his health changes and he can't look after his teeth. Uh, and uh, given, uh, uh, well, not can, can't look after his teeth, it's all medication. And uh, suddenly those teeth with fatigue, they suddenly break. Some of these are root therapy teeth. So you're only left with uh, anterior free front teeth with no root therapist. So that will then, we have to make a decision. So I told the patient, look, exactly, at the end of the day, you might only have three teeth. So uh, where do you want to go from now on? And, and that's why I gave him the options. And it's important to discuss the options with the patient. So this was important that, uh, you know, in this case, like, would you open a bite? And you agree that you're going to load a dentition if you open the bite. So uh, for the sake of three teeth, uh, you know, where would I go from here? And, uh, and so just to help everyone in the situation. The first thing I did was to, uh, to sort of try to reduce the occlusion, try to level as much as I can, which helped a bit. But, uh, you know, this man's a very aesthetic being client. He said, when I smile, I'll have a full smile. And they send pictures in my website. There's other people say, I want that sort of smile. That's why I came to see you and ask my dentist to refer to you. Whatever. So we have a number of options here, okay? So in order to create that nice smile, you have to grind the crap out of those teeth. It doesn't only fit teeth, they have a good long-term prognosis, okay? This is almost the go. He's lost all the moles, his face is caving in. That's another thing that we need to look at. And so there's all these problems that we have to deal with. So coming back to the solution, and knowing what the level of forces generated, knowing the level of support, and knowing, uh, you know, we need to look at it, what would you think? Would you still consider putting implants here and putting some here? Uh, this will go. And then, you know, anticipating, well, let's just go. So if this, let's say you got one, two, three, four teeth remaining, okay? And this is why everyone, and Leonie, please comment, as you look, you're, you're a highly experienced clinician. So here, for instance, you have 40 remaining. What will be your, will be your solution, for instance? So um, you're saying after the posterior ones are gone and he's, and that's Well, he needs a trip. He wants a long-term yeah. solution. He says, listen, I'm gonna, I just want a long-term solution. I want a long-term solution, okay. long-term stability. One of the possibilities was to take, do the alveolectomy clearance as a prescription base and two okay. implants. Fine. Okay. That's a solution. What else would you consider? Um, let me see. I would, um, I would still give some posterior support with implants. I'd replace all those missing teeth. And later on, if things do deteriorate um, and the front teeth are missing, if we've got implants, say, in the, um, you were saying the 4-3 was terminal, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, this is going. I'll tell you, this is terminal. Yeah. So is this one's terminal here. You only have four incisors from here to there. Yeah. But he, if he's got implants, say, at 4-3, something, say, like 4-5, 3, what have we got? 1, 2, 3, 3, 4 and maybe three, six. Um, then if he does lose the front teeth, we just take the tops off these, as long as the implants are planned correctly, if we've got them nice and parallel, we could actually then remove the, what was what were the bridges and replace that with a full arch sort of solution, either removable or fixed by adding so one. So you can put implants here, yep. there, here and there, I'm gonna say here and there, okay, yep. I'm gonna say. Yeah. And when these go, you yeah. can replace the cross. Yeah. Okay. Okay. With maybe something, 
psychologically yep. you may benefit from something like that right so as long as you as leone said place them in the correct position and you've got the right number of implants just removing the tops and going right across is still going to achieve this final result but it's given him that sort he's still got his own teeth which psychologically to go from this to a full clear and stop and bottom mm. okay. no problem. Mm. but you have to understand one thing that the patient if you do those little implants it's all take it's an, it's an option mm -hmm. it's an option there's no right or wrong answer here it's an option yeah, uh, and then then it starts failing. Then you have you have to come in for more treatment. You know, more this and more that. People do wear out. You know, you have to look at the patient factors too. Yeah. So that's okay, why let's you just change the scenario. Say uh, four three to three three were treatable. Yeah, I can see that way. We're getting to the point where. Either one is going to work. It doesn't really matter, right? Where do we sort of... How many implants do you need posteriorly? Well, that's a good question. Are you asking me the question or are you asking... I'm just throwing you? it out. We only anyone. Okay. As a restorative dentist, how many implants would you be happy to just have posteriorly? Is there anyone else in the audience besides Leone who's... Uh, sorry, Leone, I'm not... Uh, is anybody else out there or what? Or shall I pick a number? Huh? No one? No one yet, Dr. Sarkis. Well, come on, give me a number. Who's out there? Can you pick a, pick pick anyone's name, Shrada? Just get um, Alexander replies three implants. I think he's talking about the fourth quadrant with three oh. implants on. So you say uh, three implants uh, yep. where? Alexander, you need to can you Alexander, three implants where, please? Is that on either side? Is that each side or where? Uh, Alexander, you can just type the answer and I can just say it. Okay, he says four, seven, four, five, and four, six. Yeah, but left bridge is failing as well. Would you consider three on the left side as well? Yes. yes. Okay. So I think that would be answer would be correct. Uh, from my opinion. That would be the correct answer. I will go three implants inside. Why, Alexander? Alexander, can you come to the phone? Oh, can you come to the microphone? Obviously, why would you consider three implants on this side? He's a Bruxa, and so the more implants, the better the distribution. Okay, now let me throw another span in the wheel. What about if he suddenly loses those anterior teeth? That would be important consideration, wouldn't that? Yes. So you, you will basically go right across, correct? Yes. Very good. Very good. That's so it. if you had three implants on either side, he loses the anteriors. Would you place any more implants? Anterior? No, I wouldn't be bothered. No, I wouldn't. But there's a problem. It all looks very good. This is what I'm going to come to. Because I've put this lecture in a way to make you think why I would do the things that I do. Because if you place the implants here, See, the ridge here is uneven. There's a loss of implant, loss of bone. It'll take another two years for this to form. So patient hasn't got time to wait. So we have to think of the implants at different positions where we place the implant, and I'll talk to you about it in a minute. However, however, would you consider a lower arch? Assuming that now we decide that, you know what? Because we have really good long-term predictability on the anterior mandible interform in the area, Okay, we have over 60 years studies on this, rather than on posterior mandible. Would you, I would be more comfortable if I was able to place some implants here. Would you agree with that, Stan? Yeah, all on four, that's what it's based on. So the answer is, is it gonna be all on four, all on six? What's the answer? Alexander? I'd be more inclined for an all on six just because of the history of bruxism. And if there's adequate bone volume, uh, you would then have a more secure prosthesis. Very good. That's the answer I wanted. I want you from now on 
be part of our conversation as well as them. Okay, thank you very much for coming on board. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. And the only you're right too, because there's an option there that I agree with you as well. You know? But for a long term option after discussing the patient. So we, the patient chose all on six, but we helped the patient make that decision. I did not all in six now. I made the patient think where I'm from. He's an engineer. So it's good to talk to the engineers because you always, like you said, Leon, you're going to over engineer this case. And that's important. So, so in this particular case, here's another problem. Alex, I just want to talk to you. See, if you look at the mandible, the ridge is high here and it's low here. So if your patient smiles and the lower lip drops, if you get this unevenness, he's not going to be very happy. So this is high aesthetic case. So there's a lot of issues here. And we look at the aesthetic integration as well that needs to be looked at. So when I think of this case, for instance, let me just talk to you about the next one here. Now you can see that here's his alveolar line, okay? And what I'm trying to do is establish a prosthetic platform so you can build. So that means I have to do alveolectomy from, from more from the lower, line, lower right uh, for going all the way, all the way to the three seven. You have to get a big chunk out, okay? There's enough bone there. That's to get my platform right so I can get the smile line right and get the right restorative space and also allow them to clean his teeth better. So a lot of these things are consideration. And uh, uh, you can see that's a very strange looking surgical guy. And there's a tooth support and we go differently as another thing. But the case was that this is what we had to do. And ahead of time, this was on the mounted models, diagnosis, I get in our section of models and I look at the restorative space. I talk to my technical support. This is what we're going to do. So there's a lot of, and we maintain the OVD, we didn't change it. So we went with immediate provisional restorations. As you can see here, we have provisional restorations. We, op, we didn't change the bite, we just increased the overbite and maintain the occlusion of vertical dimension with this patient. And it's a premolar occlusion. And the patient is able to chew comfortably and immediately. And naturally, uh, when we think about this, we are also testing a system. We're testing his chewing habits while the implants are integrating. We maintain the existing occlusion of vertical dimension and we have a good restorative space to be able to restore this. That was all planned before. And you can see over here that we got fractured, uh, you know, uh, the posterior. So it's very common for the provisional research fracture. Oh, this is on the spot. I just pick it, do a pickup impression. I just made, you know, shape of the old plate and come up and just do this in the mouth. That's not an issue. But we have a good smile line for this patient. We test the steadies, we test the speech. And the distal implants are never loaded. Uh, that's very important. But the thing is that all we're doing is we also, with the media prosthesis, we testing the system to see if we do it right. Now, if something's not quite right, I'll wait about two months, then we'll modify it. We get it right, then we know where we are. But overall, we have adequate space to build. So there's another problem here. The other problem is that if you had placed implants here, Alex, and you restore them at that bone level, when a patient smiles, it'd be unevenness. You ever see them at the obvious is higher? And he's not very really happy with this. And this is what the problem is. Lower the all falls are placed by less experienced practitioners that patients come back and they can see the transition line. Can't fix it. They have to take the whole thing out and start again. It's not simple. That creates problems for lower patients. Or consider overdenture. That's when I would consider overdenture. So coming forward. You can see that there's a prosthetic platform. I'm taking an angle, but it's straight on. You can't see the level. You can see that one here, but that will be covered. But you can see the patient smiles how far it goes back. So that they actually use as a reference to actually or do our lectomy, not just doing quick, just because of implants. There's a lot of considerations that I do to make sure that I get the restored platform correct. And that's important from the, from the prosthetic point of view. 
because going from seven to seven to eleven is quite a bit of work, I can assure you. It's not that simple. And you have to have special guides, special things in place that you can know exactly where you are. And that's important. So we established a story platform. And uh, the most important thing for me is not just the stakes and function of story space, but what do you think is the most important thing for me from the patient maintenance point of view? Anyone can come up with the answer. Leonie, how about you? I haven't got an answer at the moment, Sarka. Sorry, I'm still catching up brain-wise. <laughs> no problem, it's not. Yeah. No problem. Maybe I went a bit too fast. Okay. Yeah. What it is, is if your platform is up and down, and that yeah. would be up and down if you had placed the implants here early on, it'd be a lot higher up in minimal space here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. There'll be more chance for your station to fracture. But also, it'll be very hard for a patient to clean here and come down here and clean here. Yep. This is easier to clean. You know, with a water peak and with a brush, you can just put it on and go right around and clean and on the side. And prosthetic design is very important. So this is all designed before we start the surgery. It's all designed before the surgery. We know where we are. It's all designed diagnostically, etc. It's it's a slam dunk to, you know, for me, it's not an issue. But I just want to say the thinking behind it. Mm. And we've got adequate restorative space. I'm not going to go into the how much space do we need, how much components do we need. Just, just to me, that's just not an issue. We teach it at a college. When you enter the college, we'll teach you. That's not the issue. But I just want you to think because today, everybody wants to just cut the bone and stick the implant in. And I'm a good dentist. I can do this. And the planning is the key. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Because implants are either 100% right or they're 100% wrong. Okay, when it's 100% wrong, we have a problem. We have a major problem. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sarkis, Alexander asks a question. Uh, may I ask, why didn't you extend the provisional bridge to the back? Why? Alexander, you tell me, why do you think I didn't do it? You always have experience with implants. Why do you think? What do you think? Uh, was the primary stability an issue in the back? No, absolutely not. Why would there be an issue? See, so think about it. You think I'm going to load on the implants? I have a, I have an unsatisfactory preliminary, uh, uh, unsatisfactory, prim unsatisfactory primary stability? No, absolutely not. Where else? Have you seen anyone who can load full arch on four implants in initial stages during immediate prov provisionalization? Anyone seen that? Can someone explain why I wouldn't extend all the way to the back? I'm not giving the answer, but I'm not giving the answer. I want you to tell me the answer. Unless you give me the answer, I'm going to the next one. Okay, I won't give you the answer for that one. It's like one of those uh, bank uh, passwords. I don't see the password. You can't get in your, into the account, you know, when someone tells you. <laughs> I'm not going to get it. I'm not answering that question. If you come to the college, I'll answer it. Otherwise, you won't get an answer unless you give me the answer. And I'll tell you if it's yes or no. <laughs> so... Is it going to be a secret once? handshake? Huh? I said, it's going to be a secret handshake too. Absolutely. Going once, <laughs> going twice, going um, finally, no answer, we're going next one. Okay. You work that out. Okay. You need to work that out, Alex. Good question. Very good question. But you have to work that out. Okay. So we established this. So, why do you think, what's another thing that I was able to do for this patient? I mean, from the, looking at the provision loss, okay, what else did I do for this patient by improving the overbite? What else did I do? Can anyone tell me? Well, you balance the forces um, in function. Mm -hmm. um, better so there wasn't you're not loading um, the anterior region like his natural dentition was 
Right. Um, what else are you doing? Um, Did you increase the vertical dimension? Yeah. No, I didn't. I did. I work within the dimension. I did. I'll let me. I'll tell you. I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. I'll reduce it. What else was really important for this patient and for me from the function point of view? So we maintained the existing OVD. That's very much. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sarkis, Lillian says increase interocclusal space. Yes. And that helped me to do what? Is this how we teach the college? You see, we talk about interactive learning. And if you go online learning, you'll never understand this. But interactive learning is really, really good. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, increased we, we We didn't change the OVD. We increased the interocclusal space, inter space in terms of within the RVD, we improved the overbite, right? We improved the overbite. But something else that's important, what else did our laws try to do? Why do you think I did all this bone cutting to, to be able to do what? Think about it. I'll come back to it in a minute. Okay. See, what I'm trying to explain to you is that when you're planning these cases, that's the specialist, we're not planning these cases. I know what I want to achieve. You need to plan for results, not some dilly dally throwing implants here and there, thinking that's going to work. It won't. This is the problem we're facing every day. I'm seeing two or three patients that have major implant problems every week, and I don't know how to fix it. Some of them, and people come to me and fix that. If you plan this correctly, everyone will benefit. Uh, so, Dr. Sarkis, Arthur says, uh, space for complementary. The component three, no, you, yeah. that's given. I already spoke about that. I mentioned that. That's given. Something else. Can you show them some photos of the occlusal planes? Ah, oh, come on. Look, you're being unfairly, okay? All right. That's very unfair, okay? Okay, very unfair, all right? Show very unfair, photos. okay? Okay, you happy now? Are you really happy now? That's okay. Fine. So, what was I trying to improve, guys? No one? Harry, can you talk? Uh, Dr. Sarkis, we've got a few answers out here. Lillian says, uh, maintain OVD better force distribution. Uh, Grace says, occlusal plane. And Mandy, okay. Jamie okay. Land says, curve of speed. Uh, Gray says again, you wanted to even out the occlusal plane question. Right, occlusal plane. So why I need to even out occlusal plane? Smile. Gordana says smile, like just for better aesthetics. Improve the smile. Yeah, okay. What else? Uh, reverse curve of speed is not aesthetic. Reduce curve of speed. So we've got like two questions out here, which is like one Does says... Does curve of speed apply to mandible or maxilla? Oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I'm sure that was Bibik. I, I could just hear his laugh. Because uh, Alexander says to distribute the occlusal forces. Lillian uh, says mandible. The curve of speed is for mandible. Okay. Okay, when you have flat occlusal plane, from a geometric point of view, it's easy to manage and reduce the forces. Okay, it's simple. It's less complicated. The brain can function better. The model system functions better. You have anyone heard of pattern generator? No? Yes? No? No. Fine. You can work that out. Yes? Clearly, how are you going, darling? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you enjoying this paper though? I am very much enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you react. You know, very I, I just like when Stan, he knows what I'm going through. He's just had enough. He just has to just, you know, throw the cigarette pin. Yeah. I'm not taking the gambling anymore. You're not going to come in casino with me, okay, Stan? No more casino. Okay, now. So we're testing the system. 
we improve the inclusion, we improve this, we got the platform right, we got to restore the space right. Agreed? Okay. And that's the important restore the space, right? It's very important. And uh, this is planned before. This is planned before. Uh, you're probably wondering, uh, you know, uh, what dimensions I use, what I need to do, etc. So I would never go into the equation without knowing that I, last minute, uh, last minute, Harry, if you need to talk, you need to talk because you're writing to me, my friend. Uh, why don't you come in and say a few words, even though you're on the iPhone, okay? And uh, and uh, also with a flat initial plane, Harry mentions that low cast bangles, your flat plane, it helps you redistribute, and I agree. Uh, you know, uh, it's okay to, you know, there's a lot of articles written about the occlusional prescription for implant, uh, fixed full mouth, uh, a lower arch, or both arches, occlusion, how to maintain occlusion. And there's a different theories behind. None of them really stack up to the test of time. There's no evidence on any of them. I will call this an Albanian occlusion if I need to. And uh, there's different theories. And they all work according to clinician. You just have to decide case by case basis which, which, where, and we'll teach you at the college. Now, good questions. Uh, what happens sometimes is my technical colleagues will call me saying, Cycles, I've got a problem where I was asked to come to you because we don't know how to solve this problem because the patient, you know, you really can't get a screw down here. There's not enough room there and the patient can't get to the increased overbite. And this is a problem that we need to think of. If you think, oh my God, I can't really can't put a component here on the posterior region because there's not enough room. What do you do there? The whole trip is failing, right? It hasn't been planned properly. That's why, uh, you know, it, it intrigues me when uh, people talk about surgery and implants and then talk about prosthetic platform because that's the need of platform you start. Then you go downwards and you work out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. It's just not a simple, clear, concise, not a flow chart. You have to understand those things and communicate with your patients. And we got our restored space, as you can see, and that was planned. We have adequate restored space to get all your componentry and titanium bar. And, uh, you know, this is very, very important. One of the good things about restorative space is that you're able to redistribute loading. And, you, and then naturally, as Alex said, I like to avoid my distal cantilevers given full arch. I didn't stop here. I went all the way down there because that's not an issue. I can really bolt that in and he can chew very well. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, we have a special, I designed my titanium bars very differently with my technical support to give you maximum rigidity, or there's a slightly flexibility of this. But uh, it's important that you get this up. I'm probably hoping somebody asked me a question uh, about something, but they haven't asked me the question yet, so I'll keep moving on. And you can see that there's a prosthetic screw that's actually bolted on the uh, multiple unit buttons posteriorly, and we can remove this, put it back in on multi unit level without actually going in deep inside the implant level, which is a good idea in my opinion. So, is there any question so far here? Yes, no? Dr. Sarkis, Lillian says better occlusion, occlusal plan, less stress on TMJ. That's, I think, that she's written for the before, what we were talking about. Thank you, thank no you, questions so far. Can I ask a question about TMJ? Okay. Let me ask you a question. We've got a question. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, Dr. Sarkis. We've got a question from Grace. I don't understand what is at the back. At the back, which slide? This one, left one, the right one. Um, Grace, can you write? Because I, I can see you. This uh, side, this whatever. Slide, what yeah, is the that's a, that's just a occlusal titanium, uh, basically, platform. Okay, so the denture tube, it's a crucial platform. There's a screw that goes straight to the implant. So basically, I can't, I think it's the next one. I'll show it to you. Okay, basically, it's uh, it sits, the implant's here. There's one here and there's one there. Okay, that just sits right there. Okay, so it goes straight onto the implant. That's just like a, it's like a, uh, can you see on the right? Can you see on the right? Okay, and that's where the screw lands. 
and that's not a cantilever because he wants it's got two for posing. And here is that screw is actually sitting on the metal because uh, that's actually against the upper arch. And that's, actually, there's no opposing one here. So that I'm happy to just have a little metal there. It's not an issue. They don't need to put a denture tooth there because mm -hmm. there's enough room here just for the uh, overlay type of a, a bubble to see on the. It's just this last implant is not carrying a tooth. It's purely for me as an extension to really this with forces. It doesn't have to be carrying a tooth. Okay. It doesn't have to be carrying a tooth. That's, so that's just a screw, prosthetic screw going into the bubble if that makes sense. Let me explain on the next slide, okay? So when you go to the next slide, so you have this extension, okay? And that's sitting right on that one, okay? Good arch form. Yeah. See, all on four is not enough. I could have put this in a bit more distally. There was a problem because as I was actually doing the osteotomy, it was in pain because that's where the pain was. Sometimes there's a ebra nerve supply that's coming around. You can't see on the CT scan, so you just move around. And there's adequate room here for the you know, oral hygiene part. I'm sure Dr. Boyatis would be very happy with this. And we have distal implants to reduce your cantilever. Okay. That makes sense so far? So in other words, here's your titanium bar. They're just sitting right the last bit. Okay. That goes and sits over there. It goes over there. Here a complete arch. And the patient's really happy. No, it's happy with one of the reasons that all on four, you can go probably up to the measure of the sixes. Okay. Here. But with the, you know, all on six, you can all the way, he, he likes his improved face support, he can chew very well and important. If they're going to ask me questions about something, something technically you can ask me here, but I'm not sure if you can ask me that question. However, uh, going back to our implant, you can see uh, there's four implants here. Okay, this is six months post-op. This is healing. Okay, there's a soft tissue that there's no opening here at all. It's an associate goes really well up to the implant titanium surface. So we got, you know, here, this is a I think five by six and five by six. Uh, has anyone got any question to ask me about this implant here or no? Yes, no? No, fair enough. Can you see how uh, uh, something's happening here? I'm not quite sure what's happening. And, uh, uh, the existing bridge is sitting okay. Um, so that's the opposing tooth. So you went all the way to the opposing tooth. That's where you want it. I could have stopped here. I could put implant here. Okay, if I want to, or here, or at an angle. But I chose this side because it's opposing, which is fine. Not an issue. Okay. Um, now, no questions so far? Uh, Was the temporary uh, posterior process not extend all the way to yeah, the all the way because of concern about temperature fracturing? Well, Alex, the, te the temporary also fractured. I'll show you the pictures before. Let me go back. Uh, Dr. Sarkis, Gordana asks, no cantilever when we have four implants immediate loading? Yes, but why no cantilever? See, there's a fracture here. It's only on four implants. Mm -hmm. So it tells you there's a lot of loading here. Okay. But um, you want to have the code for the password. Is that right? That was the question. Not quite cut up, sorry. You know, I want, I want more. I want more. I really Sorry. want more. Yes. Could it be? Could it be that the implants were shorter, and when you um, like when the OC integration is happening, if you uh, put too much stress, you're gonna reduce the bone height. Which one for the for the volume? posterior implants where you said you didn't load them immediately? I have a lot of them, they're not loaded immediately. Posterior, no. Only these yes. are loaded. Only these are loaded. Is that because you, um, it, did that have to do with the height of the implant? As no, in, they were shorter? No. Okay. Yeah, but these implants are, I think, uh, 11 and a half millimeters. Could be 10, could be 7 on the anterior mandible. As a matter of fact, Brenner Mark's implants were 7 millimeters by 3.75. Okay. Thanks. Yep. All right, so no. Uh, so if you give me the right question, right answer, I'll help you. But I'm not going to answer that question, but someone has to come up with the answer. That I'm going to make you sweat a little bit. So no cantilevers and four implants in mid loading. So why no cantilevers? Dr. Sarkis Bebek says uh, dial concept of over. Extruding posterior? Uh, 
be back. There's no implant. There's no teeth here. There's no implant. You mean the upper teeth? It's 74. Maybe yes, maybe no. So, okay. So let's look at the whole thing here. Okay. So, so we basically, I mean, you could ask me, I was hoping somebody asked me some other question here, but they haven't asked me yet. Any question on the lower arch? Anything? No? Yes? That's okay. So the question is, I asked myself, doctor, have you delivered? Did we do the right thing for this patient? And having said that, next question would be, what was my conditions of plan? I mean, what were things that started going wrong? Remember I spoke to you beforehand about the posterior bridge work. I'm just going to see if, okay. So when we look here, that's before. That's before. And that's after. Same passion. Okay. We've improved the occlusal plane and smile line. He's got a better lower facial support. No question about that. Okay, we also improved the uh, occlusal plane, haven't we? We reduced it by that much. I know you have reduced it much. And, you know, did we deliver for this patient? That's the initial depth. Look how deep the body is, low in size, all touching the gum. You can see it. Okay, and we had to do our work for me all along to drop the plane. And we went from here to there. So we assume that we have a happy patient. That should be right. And in many ways, we do have a happy patient. You can see that one deep bite, we maintained the occlusal vertical motion. We use the same dimension to improve the mandibular occlusion plane and improve our restorative space. Okay, and when you smile fully, there's no transition line. And that took a little bit of surgery. We planned the surgery in a way where we section the whole thing, you know. And uh, you know, we go from one end to the other, uh, and you section it based on prosthetic platform. And, uh, you know, we thought about it. And part of the reason was, part of the reason was, besides having good prosthetic platform, if you have a little, like a little healy, sinus level of bone underneath, it's very hard to clean. And it will affect the design of the titanium framework, the dimensions of it, for optimal support of the system. And also, most importantly, I need to keep my periodontals happy. <laughs> So it's easier to clean in this fashion than if it's up and down. So there's a lot of things come into play. So you need to think ahead of time, why am I planning this way? Why is the need, you know, that's so important. It's so important. Okay. Uh, you know, with our education that we provide the college, is that you need to plan for results and not for procedures. Mm. And I do appreciate when colleagues tell me, oh, you know, you need to do this and place this. Stuff. It's a recipe. It's a recipe. But it's not for that particular patient. Your treatment plan should be tailored on individual patients. And that's part of your consent. That's why there's no such as flow charts or any other problems, there's no such thing. Each patient is unique. It has to be tailored to the particular patient's needs and wants. That's why you as a diagnostician come into play because you have to think about what the patient needs. What, not what you can deliver. Not what you can deliver, what's the best for the patient. If that patient was your brother or sister or really close member of your family, what would, be, what would be your treatment plan? That's how you plan dentistry. 
So he went through a number of options and we critically analyzed all the options. And we, I thought that I delivered. Based on what? Based on my diagnosis. But it's not finished yet because finished one arch. Patient needs to know there's other problems going to occur on the opposing arch. So when the patient presents with this, not on a bridge, but on the first premolar, you ask yourself, is this a complication? So what do you think is happening here? Let me give you a hint. Is it a root fracture or a draining sinus? Come on. Well, given, it was, given huh? it was suspect on the previous x-ray sarcus, I would say draining sinus. You're but on given the money. The, uh, pardon? You're on the money. Yeah. I'll buy you champagne when I come to blue run. Okay. Okay. Woohoo. Let's do that. Okay. I promise you. Normally, yeah, you've been marvelous. And thank you, Leon. Okay. It is a draining sinus. Okay. But the fracture just goes through your mind sometimes, doesn't it? Mm. Okay. And if fracture did go through your mind, why would that happen? And you're right. We did this. We did a therapy. I don't mind. When I was overseas, I trained in, in the noise as well. So I had a really good training. So that's not an issue. Uh, if it's complex redo, I'll send it to my colleague. He can do them. He can take the responsibility. But it's straightforward. I'll just do them here. So uh, basically, uh, we retreated this and uh, we got a heel sinus. All good. Then there was a problem. The problem is we lost the bridge. Mm. And we have a root fracture. The whole thing just fell apart. Don't you love the zirconia posts? Just love them. You know, or composite posts. I never use them, by the way. Anyway, so is this a complication? When you're asking that, Sarkis, are you asking as the result of the treatment of the lower arch, is this the result on the upper? Is that That's right. That's well, that's a good question. Patient thinks that's because of the lower arch, right? You know, his bridge was fine before. See, people have, patients have very poor historians sometimes. They don't realize where they were, where they have gone to. And the good thing about this is that, yes, uh, Dr. Sarkis, Arthur says, uh, did you put a GP point in the sinus plus radiograph to see its, to see its origin? Uh, no, I didn't actually. Uh, I would, I was simply went in because it was non-vital. Uh, I could have, but I didn't. Uh, and you can, there's no reason we can't, but to me, I've seen enough of them and, and, uh, when I, when I, why do you think it wasn't a fracture? Why, why do you think it wasn't a root fracture? What, I, what would make me suspect it, it wasn't a root fracture? What would be typical classical way to diagnose a root fracture if there was one after six months? Well, you'd have a periodontal pocket associated with the fracture line that's right that's right so, pro and it drops it's oscillated pocket stan would you verify that yes yes thank you okay thank you leon okay that was the first thing so i just saw that i could have done this but it's draining signs next to the tooth tender percussion i just just went that's fine it healed up immediately video root therapy immediately that was the end of it so i would have went five 50 times back and forth, we just do immediately get a good heal, you get a dry canal, and you get to, you know, basically that's right. If there's so, any doubt at all, put a GP point in the stoma and radiograph. I agree, I agree, I agree. I could agree more. Could agree more. That's right. Okay. And uh, well, that's finished. So, anyway, long story, we're here now. Let me hear. Is this a complication? It will be a complication if we didn't address this before. Okay. It will be a complication 
if there's not has been foreseen. Patient was told that I'm concerned about the structural integrity of the supporting or foundation teeth of the bridge work. So he understands. But something else that would have done to this system that made this happen faster, what would I have been? What caused the roof fracture here, please? Uh, Shraddha. Dr. Sarkis. Can you pick a name from the audience? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think Alex has been replying quite a bit. So oh, good. Al Alex has replied. He says a closer loop overload. Okay. A closer Why, Alex? Well, you've flattened the plane, and so there's now perhaps more pressure in that area. Uh, okay. I want a bit more than that, Alex. It's, it's in the right direction, the answer. Uh, I want a bit more than that. How about Arthur? Arthur has been answering as well. Bibik said something as well. Where is it? I can't see it here. Sorry. If you see the last message before Alex, Arthur has replied about the GP point through the sinus. Okay, we've, we've sorted that out. we passed that one now. Yeah. So why would you feel a pleasure overload? I suspect you took some pressure off the uh, root canal treated tooth mm. and that may have then increased the pressure on the next tooth. Okay. Uh, okay. I understand what you're saying and I, I accept that. But I would like to think a bit more differently. Dr. Sarkis Gortana replies, opposing it, opposing his implant, so maybe the load from the implant is transferred to the tooth or the PDL. Load span of a bridge. Yeah, uh, Arthur bridge. replies, uh, long span upper bridge, comma, post, comma, fixed lower bridge, huge load. Okay. Overdenture may have prevented that. <laughs> <laughs> Lol, lol. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, it would have. It would have. Then, uh, okay. Remember, I talked about the patient's. Uh, um, what happens when you replace a failing dentition? That's symptomatic. What happens to the measure of symptomatic dentition? What happens? They can chew on that? Yep. Yep. It'd be difficult sometimes, isn't it? They chew, but it's painful. They're going to avoid that side, aren't they? When you yep. think about it. Yep. So what happens if you replace it with some fixed restorations? What happens to the, the muscles of mastication? What happens to the brain neuroplasticity? What happens? What happens to the forces? Now suddenly there's something firm the muscles can bite into. See, the load increases by about six times. Yeah. We all know this. That's about how much you correct the occlusion. And they're going to load. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's just having something fixed. See, we have, we have, a, we have a compromised system. One arch, you fixed it. And you have a sacrificial system in the upper arch because there's components that are uh, basically compromised. This whole structure integrity is compromised. So that will go whether you like it or not. So that was in my letter to the patient. So he was very upset and said, oh, but da, 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 da. I said, stop. Here's my letter. Made sense? Yes. So he understood that. See, these are sometimes patients from hell, to be honest with you. And you're the best dentistry for them. You improve their quality of life. It's never enough. That's why your diagnosis and your treatment plan has to be correct. Because... If you don't, then you'll be in an uncompromised situation and say, well, that's not my fault. And it wasn't your fault, but patients should own their problems before you start. This is where problems arise. So we say, well, I didn't tell the patient, didn't tell me, no, 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 no. Did you write this? Did you write your notes? Did you explain to the patient? I was going to take a video conference. It's not a video. You understand that this is what we're doing. You understand why we're doing this. So they understand. And they do appreciate the fact that you actually done the right thing to explain because this is called feasibility so you see knowledge takes time experience 
my knowledge called feasibility. So you know, if you do this, you're going to get that. If you do this, you're going to get that. That's what we teach at the college. Because you're not going to learn this on distance learning. You're not going to learn this by going one or two day courses. No one will give you that. But you have a couple of mentors who actually point you in the right direction and make you think. So you got to ask, start asking the right questions to get the answers. Because just saying why and get an answer doesn't make you think. So if you need to make the audience think, we need to make you, and thank you all for participating in this concept. And uh, so is it a complication? The problem is, what is your contingency plan? So what was it? We knew about it. So to me, it's not a complication, but it's a, it's a complication that has been foreseen, okay? It's an anticipated complication, okay? Patient was aware, okay? And we know how to deal with this. So complication is different level. There's a passion level, okay? And there's a tooth level, gum level, bone level. So you're gonna break it down. But most importantly, we can fix this. But if the patient feels that somehow it was not managed, then it doesn't matter how well you work you do, it means nothing to the patient. And that's what I'm trying to make a point in this seminar. So finally, is this a complication? Okay. I mean, when you think ahead of time, okay, is it learning? Who cares? You can have an open inclusion here that can still fracture if they want to chew on it. Okay, the increased loading. Okay, you just gotta understand not everything's mechanical. Biology, biomechanics you need to think about, okay? You know, what is the inclusion responsible? You know, increased loading, fatigue. There's so many things, variables here. And that's just one thing. So you should understand the concept of overall patient management, overall risk assessment, okay? And to think that risk will change with time and how to plan to minimize complications. Mm. So I'm looking at the images. It's a fracture. What's this? What's this? See the classic J curve? Okay, not all J curves are commensal root fracture, but there's a fracture. It's obvious. There's a fracture going right here. There's another one different angle going right there. Okay. So having said that, I hope there's any more questions I can answer. That's the lecture there. I have a question about the occlusal planning, Sarkis. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you before you showed me the fractured bridge, because there was that history of that porcelain missing off the bridge. That's how, right. when you're planning the occlusal scheme of the lower restoration, um, how much, when you've got that sort of thing on the opposing arch, would you then design, like when you design it, are you designing with the knowledge that that will be replaced or are you designing it with the knowledge that you're working with it and adapting to it or trying to get a solution between those two pay points, assuming there are different two points? Okay. I would have to address that following way. Number one, this is a lower acrylic uh, uh, tie based denture. It is yep. not a heavy, heavy um, uh, porcelain base. It's not porcelain, it's acrylic. So acrylic allows us some sort of wear, which I never use the conion lower arch at all. When you restore your arches, you have to have a sacrificial arch because it's a wear. So acrylic will wear very well against the natural teeth and also against the upper teeth. So, and so as I'm concerned, uh, I will refine my occlusion to have good multiple contacts. I will clear this with my movements here, mm -hmm. and, you know, can I guys? That tooth now starts to worry because it's been root therapy, so I will reduce that so I clear it. Yep. Go sideways and be clearing on the canines. So from that point of view, would I be thinking about replacing this teeth? Absolutely. Will it change my plane? No, because mm -hmm. then I have a manual plane that's correct to the smile line, it's parallel to the eye level, the eye. I can build occlusion because I've done it in the right way. So from there, it wouldn't matter because this tip will fail. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say to the patient, well, we're just going to maintain you until they fail. When they fail, then get in there and fix the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if he decides, for instance, to go to, to go to Africa and work as a missionary, right? Oh, you would say, you know, yeah. some people do that. Then I will say, in long term, we need to put some implants here. I'm also going to put some implants on the upper left side. Okay. So he's thinking now, 
well, this is failed. What about this side? So he wants both sides done. That makes sense? Because he understands the problem I'm facing. Yeah. Okay, so that would be my answer in terms uh -huh. of... Thank you. My uh, pleasure. Dr. Sarkis, we've got two questions. One is mm -hmm. from Grace. Uh, how to truly ensure you are getting full consent from the patient in such a huge treatment plan with multiple steps. And one's from Arthur. He says, any indication on the pre-op CBCT of the failing 1-5? Any indication of pre? Pre-op. Yeah, pre-op CBCT of the failing 1-5. It's here. That's a common CT. Oh, pre-op. I, I, I didn't bring it. I didn't bring it. I'm sorry. I, I have to go and find and bring it up there. Uh, it was okay, uh, on, but when you think about it, let's have a look back. That's the only one I have, but this is not a true RPG. So in, in the real sense, let me finish this case. Let me find the RPG here. Okay, it's here. Okay, you can see some area here. And I'm not sure with the RPG I could have related to that. It's very hard to tell, but it's only a matter of time before they go. So it could have been frac fractured there, it could be anything. You're just sitting there waiting to happen. So we don't really know. Good question, by the way. We don't really know. Now, how does it truly really ensure that you're getting full consent from a patient in such a huge treatment plan with this? Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Grace? Do you do this sort of treatment in your practice? Um, I refer this. Right. Okay. I think I think it's a good idea if if it's considered. I think the referring specialist will go through the stages of the patient, explain all the different stages. I mean, I normally do, and I also have the the, uh, the general practitioner part because they are important part of the treatment process because you're doing a lot of maintenance for this patient, and uh, and uh, in in many ways uh, I will have you in my practice where you consent, you consult. You're part of the practice. So it's usually referred, let's come here. We, we got a patient here, Mark, and so we just talk together and discuss how we're going to do it. And I'll probably video record it and uh, write a letter that to make sure that the rationale behind my decision making process, this is this, 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 this. So I will say, here's the reason for my decision making based on this, 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 this. And therefore, we agreed that this is a forward plan. And based on this, we're going to do step number one, two, three, four, and that's how we do it. I hope that answered the question for you. In the college, we go this is specifically because when you treat your cases, you're going to write a consent to your patients. And, you know, um, and we have, you know, 20 students, each one's got five cases, you've got 100 cases to look at. My God, there's a lot of cases to learn from. I hope that answered your question. It's a good question. Grace also asks, does this patient sign a treatment plan? Well, consent is a treatment plan sign. Absolutely. Consent and treatment plan go together. You, you don't write uh, like a financial, you go tick, one or two, two, five, tick. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's going to be specific to that patient. At these stages, you write, we're going to do this and then we're going to do that. Each stage is done. So, you know, over the period of time, I have a lot of templates which I made. So my PA knows what goes where. Uh, and uh, I go in bed and finalize it and change the way I think it should be changed for that particular you know, rationale behind the treatment plan. Not just for implants, for any treatment. You have to give them a rationale. Even if some patients have known me, I've been this long time. They say, oh, look, I don't need a letter. I still write a letter. I still write a letter. So that gives them an understanding to ask me a question. Never assume that you're patient on everything. You assume that you don't know and you're doing something to get it right for them. So think about that. So that's what I was saying. Writing a letter for complex cases takes time because you're actually thinking what you're gonna write there. Okay. Any other questions? And we teach you this at a college. We actually teach you. Any other questions? Uh, no, okay. Uh, Arthur says, anterior teeth pinging off hybrids is the bane of my life. Any tips to minimize slash prevent this happening? Anterior teeth pinging off hybrids. 
Okay. Okay. All right. Is it all right? Okay. Look, it happens. It's it, it happens to me too. But it's a design. It's a design of your framework. So um, it's how you design your framework. Um, uh, I have specific design with my technician. You can see my framework here. I had design, so each one designed to carry on the table and special pins. Some of the heavy brush, we had, had an extra pin, so to to get the acrylic. And uh, you know, my technician else would cut, and we just get a really good bonded. Look, some of those things uh, snap break, and that's fine because understand. I mean, yeah, we implant a solid system. There's no movement of the membrane, so it's not give. We tell the patient. That's why I like acrylic teeth. It's easier to repair. So. I'm not much of a fond of zirconia bridge work on the lower arch, not at all. Upper arch, I have no problems with that. But zirconia, lower arch, no, uh, that I'm not comfortable with. I would even prefer to have uh, titanium on titanium with acrylic, uh, you know, teeth and, and just let zirconia go all together. Because it's always a bit of a gear, it's good. I enjoy titanium with acrylic. I mean, there's more chance of fracture, etc. but I don't have a problem with that. You know, it's easily fixed uh, if it happens. Uh, you have to understand that it's going to be where it's going to be natural where you have to explain to the patient just because you paid all this money doesn't mean things not things there's a, a maintenance issues in everything there's maintenance issues and they have to understand that's part of your level that you discuss the maintenance issues they have to understand don't make it too complicated but enough so that it makes sense not like a good logical sense it's about you know common sense approach to the treatment plan that's very important Well, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Dr. Sarkis, we've got one more question. Do you recommend the college for the people with minimum experience? Question Absolutely. Mark, or is it for more? No, 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 no. Very I good think, question yeah. from Grace. Grace, yeah. remember I talked to beforehand. It's about getting the right experience. Okay. And now people come to the college because they want that right experience. They've had experience, wasn't right. Okay, they want more. They want the right experience. I mean, I went back to postgraduate education after what, being in the practice for about 15 years. There was a prominent moment in my life and I said, listen, I actually don't know much. And I'm, I can see not progressing unless I start, you know, getting into education and understanding. And I can show you one thing, in a, in a college we teach you, but most of it we teach you how to think. So you will learn what to look for and we'll teach you how to find your own answers to the problems. And we'll confirm that with you once you find your answers. You know, it's a, such a dynamic learning program. This is unique. No one's got this in the world. It's not about great learning. Here's your recipe, see you later. It doesn't work that way. I mean, before the lecture, I was discussing the lecture with Stan before I came in. I mean, Stan drills the crap. I mean, he really drills me. I mean, he's my mentor as well. I've been my mentor when I was doing my, you know, at the university. I mean, I mean, good colleagues as well. I mean, he's my parent office. But what I'm saying is that it's through that drilling each other, putting each other on a, on a sort of a tight spot that you think about these cases, you know? You need to justify why you're doing it. It's very important, you know? And that's very important to get that confidence by having the right experience, okay? I remember I was in uh, Eastern Block teaching and, you know, over there, someone's got a bigger voice, has got a bigger sort of power, they speak loud and the louder they speak, the more they scare people because their opinion counts and running science. And he said to me, stop all this diagnosis and triple planning. I've done this thousands of times, you know, and I know what I'm doing. I want to know solutions. And I stopped for a second. I said, who was the gentleman? And they sort of came up and said, what was me? And he said, stand up. I said, good question. I agree with you. But has it ever occurred to you that you've done this thousand times wrong? And that what sort of made him realize that Hang on a minute. Let's just sit back. Because I like to look at my cases and I learn from my failures. And I will show you my failures where it went wrong, where it could have done better. Okay. And that's what it's all about is sharing experience. Like, you, you know, for instance, uh, I got a message the other day saying, uh, How many cases do you do? Like, I mean, Shrada, how many cases do you see like this? Natasha, are you there? Or are you sleeping, Natasha? No, are you sleeping or are you still there? No, no, I'm, I'm still here. I, I see these patients every day. These are yes. like, 
Yeah. The ones on the prospectus, they're just not from Instagram or Facebook or from Google. These are like real patients coming in every day. So I've been working with Dr. Sarkis since 2019. And I think he's one of the most fantastic practitioners I've ever Oh, thank worked. you. Thank you. But I'm, I'm not trying to sell our course or anything, but trust me, I, I, it, it's an honor. It's a privilege. I mean, if I ever go back to my own country and I say that I've worked with somebody like this, oh my God, it's just, for me, it's too much. And you, and you learn, we teach you. It's about teaching. It's not about... You know, it's not about how good I am or how good my colleague uh, specialist is. We got to make sure how good you become. You know, to me, if a student has achieved the level of competence and that gives you the confidence and they can sit back, I mean, you know, to me, that's the ultimate. It's so beautiful to see students succeed in their everyday dentistry and become very good at what they do. But, but seriously, the, the most important thing is that uh, when you realize that I want to learn and that's so crucial it can happen at any age so uh, you could be just out of university uh, you could be just out of you know having a few years experience you want to get to the next level like you got these little one or two day courses I mean what do you learn how you connect you know you lose about you know 95 percent information the next day and then the person only shows you what happens in his hands I mean I can do this in my hands. How do I translate this so you can think and do it in your hands? Unless you have a mentor who guides you through this. You know, you got, you know, good specialists on board that there's a case, we look at the case, we help you, you start thinking, oh, why does he think this way? Why does he think that? What was I thinking this way? And you start formulating your own, uh, your own pattern of, uh, you know, thinking in terms of, right, maybe I looked at not just this particular area, I might be looking at a different area. So that becomes a norm eventually, and that's when you will graduate and you, you know, become highly competent practitioners. And that's what the aim of the college is, is to bridge the gap in the education. I was telling Stan early on today, there's a problem with the education right now, okay? That's why we started college, you know? And people have empirical understanding of what, what, what to do. It's empirical. It's not about really good thinking. Like, I just feel sometimes the common sense is not common anymore. And you say, like, what's a simple way to treat this problem? It's more complicated. Why make things complicated? Why simplify the concept? See, I'm here to simplify. I look at the thing, okay, what's the simplest way to do this? Less invasion, less intervention, less costly, more predictability. You know, just because it's costly, sometimes I get called it's really complicated treatment. But simple treatment would be just as good and effective and less invasive. So... When you, we start exploring those cases with the students, they realize, look, I've learned not just from my case, I learned from my colleague's case, you share each other's notes, it's all about learning, building a platform. I mean, the most important thing is, in my opinion, of the course that I give is, how to take a good photo, how to take the right photo, that's gonna be meaningful to you, how to take a diagnostic photo, so when you look at it, you can make a diagnosis. Okay, people say to me, well, oh, I have a good camera. I don't give stuff about the camera. It's what the eye cannot see, the mind cannot recognize. So your images tell me what you're seeing. You know, you can't shoot here and get an image like that. You need to look what you're looking at and then take the image because you want to know what you're looking at. Like it, it stands when people bring uh, non-clinical clinical photographers who come and tell you how to take a photo. Well, you know what? You want to see this from the clinician teaching you how to take a photo because that's my photos. No one's taking this photo. It's not my stuff. Hasn't they? I wish they could, but they won't. Yeah. Why is that, Natasha? Natasha slept, I guess, Dr. Sarkis for the day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll be most happy to take your photos. So it is important that when you take, take it, it's diagnostic. When you're trying to make a statement, or you want to think about how you're going to do this case. So that's matter what you do. As long as your photos are diagnostic, I know what you're seeing. That's really important to me. Okay, I, I still mark a lot of the uh, papers uh, for the um, lot of papers for the for the college. I should get my summer some I just remembered, and. Uh, and people go and do these courses from all around the world. And sometimes somebody with really heavy duty, really good camera takes his photos and discuss the case. Whereas I have another one from, from a Sierra, Sierra Leone where they have minimal camera, minimal, but they know what they're talking about. And then their little 
iPhone camera or little any of those old phone cameras, they take a photo, present the case, they get higher marks because what they're showing me makes it clear the case that they know what they're talking about. Does it make sense? So all these little things are important, you know, take the right image. And, uh, and uh, if the only little clue I can give you is when you take images, you make sure that you don't charge your patients for taking photos because they're your diagnostics. If patients decide to do anything else, that's your photos and it belongs to you. That will be unbelievable. So my photos belong to me. And that's important. So don't charge for it. That's your diagnostics. So we don't be at college and Stan will be here soon. And, uh, you know, we talk about how to do, you know, all these little things, starting from uh, diagnostic radiography, uh, photography, treatment planning. And we say, oh, no, I don't want to do this. I want to do that one. Well, do you not? Because all this is covered. Uh, we've, uh, uh, you know, periodontics, aesthetics, then this is very important. Years. We've, I think we changed it around to help students, you know, if they want to part one of the course. So it's two parts so that we can diploma. I think we put minimum integration for years on this one, period on the next one. But fixed postodontics, you do this every day. I mean, this will change your eyes, you'll open your eyes when we do this. Remote postodontics, okay. We're given this to the prosthesis. Can't believe you guys, okay. This is a dentist job. Okay, implant prosthesis and surgical planning. See, we don't have surgical planning. I mean, I can't believe that dentists actually send their CAT scans to a non-dentist who plans their surgery and it gives them a guide. I can't believe this is happening. Okay, but you should learn how to plan these cases. We'll teach you all that. And then we'll talk about dental facial studies and full model construction. I mean, by the time you've done this, you will start coming through the ranks and knowing how to do this. You know, how to create that special face, how to make somebody look good. I showed last week some photos of before and after patients, but how to get predictability, that's the key. And how to be competent and confident, it's important. How to talk to patients. So that's important to me. And, uh, and, and dentistry is uh, an art as well as a science. And that's the important part to put two things together. Okay, any other questions? That was a good question, uh, Grace. So it's for everyone. It's for everyone. And I do learn from you as well. Thank you all. It was a great seminar. I really enjoyed this webinar. Yeah, thank, thank you, Stan, you. and Leonie, and Strada, and uh, Pooja, and all the participants, and Natasha. Thank you, Dr. Sarkis. Thank you, Dr. Sarkis. I'm, um, guys, a long story short, I'm just going to be attaching my number below. So please 